Welcome, everyone, and even if you are not merely one, I'll be your obviously anonymous host today for what has become an unexpected mini series on the integral stage discussions about that most delightfully clandestine and half hidden of topics, the pornographies. What do they look like when viewed through a variety of more multifarious, nuanced, developmentally oriented, and integrative lenses? So this is not just a series about the problems and possibilities of sexuality, but more specifically about the production, use, and significance of provocative depictions of sexuality through various media, epochs, cultures, brains, and in various ranges of complexity and insight. What I'm personally most interested in are people who have evolved in their own views on pornography, people who have curiosities that fall outside of conventional discussions on these topics, and especially people who have either now or in the past found ways of weaving explicit material into their lives of inner practice. And if that all sounds a little odd, great. That's exactly why we need to be having these discussions. I don't care if the listeners like porn or not. I don't care if you think it is on the whole positive or negative for cultural evolution. It is simply something that human beings have spent a lot of time and energy creating and interacting with, and conversely, perhaps disturbingly, not a lot of time exploring from more nuanced and developmental perspectives. So I'm glad to be joined by our anonymous female guest to see if we can find a better class of curiosities in this regard. Hello, anonymous. Hello. <laughs> what, on, what on earth makes you interested in having a conversation like this? So I've been going through training as a sexologist through the Somatica Institute um, over the last year. And um, it's brought me to a lot of uh, self-exploration and trying to understand what I need to actually have out of the way in order to be like, you know, a big enough space to actually hold the whole realm of sexuality and people that I might be helping to, you know, enhance or work with issue things they see as issues or problems or develop a sexuality or anything like that. So that's creating that container to be able to help people in that realm has led me on many deep explorations into pornography and my relationship to it, you know, as well as all the other areas of sexuality. Great. You know, one of the things that struck me this morning preparing for this interview is the way that the initial context for spiritual or self-developmental practices changes in different historical and technological circumstances. Now, one of the things I often do is point to ancient Taoist skepticism about the immediate meaning of cultural symbols, uh, the Tao that can be spoken is not the true Tao, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And yeah. while that might have been an interesting attitude to explore in ancient China, bringing more consciousness to otherwise automatic beliefs that we can recognize and adequately use our symbols, the current context is different. We're in an age of addictive hyper-reaction to algorithmically skewed, socially transmitted digital content. So that pause, that Taoist pause between incoming information consciousness might now be a general survival skill that perhaps we should be training up in our children. So I'm interested in how different contexts might differently emphasize facets of we, what we could generally call the Dharma. And along those lines, there was a time, maybe most of human history, where people in general had no access to varieties of indulgences. So the majority of people interested in self-refinement or self-realization through history lived in situations with very limited access to information, to art, to diverse types of human beings. They had very little access to safe cultural exploration or personally controlled entertainment. There was no machinery for marketing fantasies and drugs and music and clothing to them, etc. Maybe a few aristocrats, but not generally. Today, though, it's very different. Today, a huge number of people have access to untold amounts of entertainment, strange food, addictive chemicals, customizable interfaces, every kind of information. And we're constantly solicited for our evaluation of content, and we're not stressfully constrained by violently enforced social norms. So that's not 
the historically common context in which spirituality and maturity and intelligence and depth and authenticity have had to emerge. When we talk about porn, we're no longer discussing it in the normal historical context, but in a contemporary context of massive and personally controlled access to indulgences of all kinds. So it struck me that we can't simply write off indulgence as an abnormality the way people might have done in the past, but we have to take it seriously as an example of the context in which people are starting their maturational paths in the current world. So I'm curious if you have feelings about the way our access to pornography has changed and also what that might mean for how we go forward in our attempts to cultivate more wisdom in ourselves and our relationships and our civilization. Well, it's kind of, uh, there's like a lot of counterintuitive curves to that, right? So when I think about people that came up with pornography from a very young age, say six years old, eight years old, being exposed to pornography, developmentally, that's going to objectify things. And the objectification is kind of the act, right? That's that, that's what the act is made of. Um, whereas people that aren't exposed to that are potentially going to think about, um, you know, something stemming out of a relationship, for example, where sexuality is something that they're making with another person. So there's like this different placement of how that shows up if you have access to those materials. And I'm assuming you're talking about like accessibility to the internet, but like, you know, for men, access to actual sex has actually declined in recent times while their porn use, you know, globally, men and women has increased. So um, I think as far as like the point of, you make about a survival tool, um, the capacity to be self-aware of your awareness and how it's structured and how those images and messages inform the narrative that you live as is really, it, it is definitely a survival tool. Um, it's also potentially like a survival tool for the species, right? Because there's like the dopamine response system, you know, if we were just given kind of endless stimuli we would just kind of sit in a room and die and not eat um you know there's there's a part of our brain that would do that anyway um so that accessibility and being able to see how that accessibility is shaping your life experience and the life path and the things that you're going to do sexually over your lifespan is a freedom that not many people i think have been able to afford because our society really doesn't support us in developing an awareness to have um, an ability to shape our own experience of our lives. So while we have all this abundance and everything, it's actually not really this richness of experience that we have because we're just kind of dragged by it, if that makes sense. And I think that's, I think that's what you're pointing to when you say it's a survival tool, really, it could become that in the future. The positive and negative versions of the two-way dynamic between sexuality and pornography, right? So there's there's ways in which people's sexual lives could be opened up by or closed down by pornography. And there are ways in which people's use of pornography can be uh, legitimately or illegitimately connected to their actual sexual behaviors and sexual preferences. And it seems like we can underestimate and overestimate the connections moving in both directions. Yeah. I mean, something I find working with clients a whole lot of the time is that there's so much confusion because they're going after the things sexually that they think are really going to satisfy them based on their pornography consumption or the messages they've gotten through media. And then suddenly they have low desire or, you know, erectile dysfunction or, sexual anxiety or pain during sex, like there's a whole host of things that happen where the body isn't really matching up with what the messages the brain thinks is supposed to be happening. And, you know, whatever that unconscious programming or assumptions we have, and then the actuality of what our core desires really are. So what we find is that, you know, pornography is a visual stimuli that's hyper, you know, hyper real, and it's supercharged and it gets you to a place where you can have an orgasm potentially and people use it in that fashion for stress relief for you know all kinds of things but they're not actually engaging with the content as if they're going to perform those actions and I think that what happens is people become very disillusioned with sexuality because even though they can get that hyper stimulation through pornography um, when they're acting it out themselves or the inability to have access to act it out themselves 
that kind of comes into a mix. And I think the core, like the middle path between those, like this is healthy and good, you can use it for um, growth, and this is really bad for you, is that, okay, it's okay to have a cheeseburger once in a while, right? Um, so there's nothing wrong with that, you know, kind of use of porn of something you're not going to actually engage in as an act for a masturbation session or something like that. As long as you can know um, that the thing that you're actually, you know, basically wiring your brain to be aroused by isn't something that your body would actually enjoy in real life. So there's there's those stop gates where you're going to create problems for yourself if you don't have awareness around, you know, how it's impacting you. And I think self-awareness is probably the biggest thing that most people don't have sexually because there's so much shame around any sexuality that isn't this core mainstream trope that people aren't really allowed to explore what feels good to their body and what their core desires are. And the fact that those are typically shaped in childhood makes it even more difficult to kind of really be honest about why we are attracted or not attracted to certain things or ideas and sometimes the narrative, not the act, is the turn on in the pornography. Seems like one of the f- necessary things that consciousness should be able to do in these areas is mm, more sufficiently tease apart different domains of experience, right? So that if we're, if we're conflating our social, relational, physical, and fantasy lives, then we can get into a lot of unexpected disasters and self-sabotage so in order to be able to separate those out at least in how we think about them and experience them would be a great first step but then that first step requires that we be able to have a look at them with intelligence yeah exactly so what would the first domain be really would we be you know viewing pornography uh you know, younger people seeking education or just out of curiosity, maybe that's probably the first place many people contact it. Yeah, it's a very interesting one. You know, I think about this problem a lot, which is that uh, people who are relational and organic and adaptive tend to have this feeling in relationship to children that you don't have to force things on them that they will come to you you know in my parental (laughs) functions i have that bias a lot oh they'll they'll let me know when it's time to exchange around them but that very often ignores the a, a whole prelude period in which framing might be essential but then those are conversations a person doesn't necessarily wish to initiate so the question of how we would set up things that prime people's brains early on so that their encounter with this overtly available material leads them in a better direction. I think that's a really uncertain topic. It's a very open question that isn't even being asked very much. Yeah, and I think there's a lot of ways to have conversations that do set a stage for a healthier association to sexuality that don't have to be sexually explicit. So, you know, when we're younger, we we all know that there's a certain degree of intimacy or closeness that feels vulnerable or uncomfortable with people physically and just in our awareness, just be it sharing space and sharing presence and, you know, telling things that are embarrassing about ourselves. Like children understand that. And I think that's the place where, you know, you can begin to just talk about what intimacy is between two people um, without it having anything to do with the physical, um, you know, the physical sexual layer. Um, And then when that comes online later, that can be seen as a tool you can use to make many different types of sex, right? There's not one type of sexuality. And I think pornography tends to point towards certain types of sexuality Um, And then that intimacy isn't required because that's kind of, you know, how the vehicle of pornography became built, right? It wasn't built as something where you have intimacy. It was something where you got, you know, the explicit physical sexual nature, different types of acts and stuff like that that you could look at. It wasn't anything to do with actually relating to another human sexually. There's a 
a British novelist and philosopher named Colin Wilson, who often pointed to masturbation as a radical evolutionary breakthrough in nature. Uh, like that we, mm -hmm. there was an emergent ability to create states of aroused energy and focus and pleasure through imagination and symbolism rather than just through responses to the biomaterial circumstances in which our drives evolved. And he saw this as a, like a premonition of future capacities in which humans could intentionally use focus and imagination to produce flow states, peak states, intentionally amplified meaning experiences. So that's very intriguing to me. But for most people, there's a kind of more modest reality in which symbolic content, images, and words, the layer of graphic and narrative fantasy is utilized to tweak our states of chemical, emotional, and behavioral arousal. And we do that in lots of different ways in our lives. And it can be mm -hmm. useful, but we ought at a certain point, the casual capacity can become a, a tunnel of reciprocal narrowing that generates addiction or dissatisfaction or otherwise becomes a barrier to the very experience it was trying to enhance. So if people are, mm -hmm. as they are, going to explore a fantasy layer which is pretty universal. How do they do that wisely? What's, what's the key, do you think, to approaching but not crossing the threshold at which the artificial and imaginal becomes a detriment? I think, well, I mean, I have to kind of go back to my embodied state. So I understand what you're saying, but I don't relate some of the concepts, concepts you're saying to like how it feels inside of me, but I see what you're pointing to. So inside of me, though, like, the way that pornography feels is that there's an image and then I have, you know, how I see the world and what those images represent to me. And then I just have my body's response to those images. And those are two separate things. So if I'm holding in mind and I can see those responses happening as I'm viewing pornography, um, I can really be much more conscious of why tweaking my, you know, why this does this within my psyche, why this does this within my body and learn a lot about myself, really. Um, but I think it becomes problematic when we're just seeking a state of pleasure, and we just look for what gives us that state of pleasure, and then we form a narrative about ourselves based on what brings us to that state of pleasure. So then we have an anchor that our psyche or ego, our self, is kind of like, I'm this because this turns me on. And then I have to build this whole, you know, everything else in me is built around that, because sex is so shameful, it's so charged, it's so powerful that, you know, it really shapes a lot of how we move through our lives um, and view ourselves, whether we're, you know, a freak that has to hide in a closet or whether we're this boring vanilla person that's, you know, sanctioned by all the religions and, you know, taboos and stuff. We don't, we don't cross those, we're good, right? Or something like that, right? So it really does shape all the way through the rest of the self-system. And that self-system also dictates what we're allowed to be turned on by and not. So sometimes we're going to have a self-system that's not going to actually allow us to access those things, and it's going to give us a lot of shame and pain um, around having those types of attractions. So I think you're right. There's a thought tunnel that's created, though, and that thought tunnel is based on our self-system being stable. So I liked this. I was turned on by this at one point. That meant this about me. And now I can't be turned on by this thing that I'm apparently turned on by in my body now, or, you know, consciously, I can't accept that though. So, yeah. And, I, and then I think people have to build a narrative that fits that. So that's all they have left to do. And, you know, that limits them quite a bit. In developmental theory work, there's this general assumption that we move through pre-conventional, conventional, and post-conventional phases of the richness of our experience. And the conventional layer that uh, typically deals a lot with um, identifying ourselves in some kind of socio-symbolic identity narrative. Um, and the natural yeah. growth, we would think, is to be able to accept that about ourselves, study that about ourselves, look at the nuances and the alternatives to that and grow into a place where we're not dissociated from, but are perhaps transparent to those identities, more open to more things. But it 
seems like there are certain kinds of functions in the mind and in the brain that allow that development to continue along any particular path. Things like intentionality, things like curiosity, things like observing the interplay between different value systems. And if, if you have a, a sense of behavioral shame, a sense that you can't talk about or discuss something, that you have to conceal it, that you have to quickly move in and out of those spaces, then those spaces become airless. They become, they're not penetrated by the factors in ourselves that would allow the development to continue along that line. Yeah, they're kind of like airtight little um, rubber maids of, you know, left behind parts of ourselves we can't explore anymore. And, you know, over time, I think that's why a lot of people have, you know, issues with desire and issues with um, being able to access, you know, their full sexuality and expand that. Um, I think a lot of people get stuck in their development and that line of development, you know, kind of becomes fixated. And the, you know, as far as pornography is concerned, like there are some ethical considerations for sure, like, but there's plenty of, like, ethical porn out there. So there's not, you know, there's not really a blocker to this is bad. Um, There's nothing that tells us that any specific sex act is bad unless it causes harm or it breaks consent, right? Um, You know, as long as there's enthusiastic consent, pretty much anything goes. Um, And I think as a society that, you know, sex positivity has kind of made it on the table but I don't think that we have really mined the depths of what it's meant for us to be so puritanical and so repressed and so ashamed for so long. Um, you know, pornography, you know, as it, it has been around forever, but it's never, it hasn't been like a sanctioned thing. It hasn't been a thing that's celebrated. Um, you know, it's pretty denigrated. It's not like you go to, uh, you know, a cocktail party and say, hey, I saw the neatest porn last night. It was this and this. And what do you feel about sexual desire? And what are you into? You know, people don't have conversations like that. And I'm not saying that that should be the case, but I don't think there's even a question in anyone's mind that they wouldn't go up to someone and ever say that to them in public. Right. And I wonder why that's the case. You know, why are we so, why is it such a secret, you know, that we, that we have sexuality? (laughs) in society in some ways. And there's this kind of double life or something like that. Yeah. There's seemingly a few different aspects to that, at least that immediately come to my mind. Um, One is the unknown relationship between our general identity and our sexual identity, right? That there might be something about sexuality that's just by its very structure, so intensely personal that we, that we keep it Mm -hmm. at the core as much as we can. Then of course there's the risk that you're going to run into social flack and distress and feedback. And then we sort of learn that very early on in terms of our access to explicit materials, whether it's shown to us or not, we seem to assume that we're at risk by exposing that material. But uh, there's another element that interests me a lot, which is a kind of shame you know, the few times that I've been really drunk, the next day, I felt the shame before myself, like as if I had failed consciousness itself, that I, that there was this sort of agony that I associated with not being present with enough of my parts. And I feel like if people are going into experiences where they're ignoring a whole bunch of themselves in order to get down this one tunnel of self-narrative and arousal, that there's a kind mm-hmm. of, of almost organic shame at having failed to show up as a full being and not wanting to bring that in front of others. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, I actually feel that really strongly when as you're talking about that. Like, I, I definitely experienced that myself, too. Like, there's, there's such a an innocent like playfulness and just fun to pleasure that it seems light inside me. Like it seems fun. Like sex can be fun. It can be light. It doesn't have to be this heavy, serious, like, Oh my God, you did what, or you like what. And, but there's so much disgust out in the world 
at, you know, talking about sexuality, just just talking about it in a way that where it's fun, where it's enjoyable, where it's, you know, you're kind of free to just be how you are with it. I don't know why it brings to mind this comment. Um, I was talking to a friend of mine and we were talking about different types of, of there's all these cultural, um, you know, offshoots like swingers and poly and stuff where sex is very positive and practiced and social, you know, they do talk to each other about a lot more of this anyway than is typical, right? So when I'm in those, you know, groups, I'm like, oh, wow, this is a much more open area. You know, people will share porn with each other. And one of the things they said, you know, I was talking about, um, you know, STIs and how there's stigma around that and how I think in some ways that shutters people into not promiscuity because it aligns with the negative value judgments and taboos around it. And it gives them a tan- you know, tangible object to point to, to say that's not safe so that they don't have to look at the emotional unsafety of opening up their sexuality and revealing more of themselves and showing up. Um, but if you like, and having been to some swingers parties, people there don't really show up as their real self. They show up as their sexual self. Right. So it's a very different dynamic in that it's still split. It's still not integrated. It's still not very, I don't think it's very healthy. Like we could do better. You know, it would be great if that was integrated as oneself. Um, but in some communities, they do have environments where people show up where that's integrated and that's the same thing. And um, it doesn't feel to me when I'm in those types of groups to be any kind of problem socially. Like there's just a basic sense of care that is normal to humans that shows up um, in the place of the fear and people are just kind of careful. And sometimes people step on each other's toes, just like we do with business and work and, you know, family, but you know, it's the same type of deal, right? People get burned in all these other areas too. It's not um, being more open and showing up like that sexually isn't going to cause anyone specific harm anymore except for potentially like, you know, people being judgmental and triggered by it because they're ashamed of their own situation. Seems really important that there are subcultures and spaces where people can explore these things Um, because we don't know, you just don't know how you're going to respond emotionally and physically to different kinds of things until you go through it. And there's no set way to go through it correctly but there is a limitation imposed mm-hmm. by simply not ever experiencing your response, especially at the edges of things. When I think yeah. about development, like there's a, I think one of the interesting critiques and you touched on a little bit is you can have spaces that are much more open, but they're not necessarily deeper or more evolved. They haven't necessarily uh, integrated or realized more. They might just have, escaped from some other conventional distress into, uh, I mean, it might be a healthier cultural mode, maybe, maybe not, but it's not necessarily a higher or deeper cultural mode. Yes, correct. It's not integrated. So how could it be? It's, but it's, it's at least acknowledging that there needs to be a place apart from our regular lives for these areas in us to evolve or have get oxygen, I think is the main thing like these put these places within us don't get oxygen and it's really hard to oxygenate it in a monogamous couple with no outside sexual influences over a lifespan also to keep any kind of freshness in that you know is luck i think i think that you would need outside input and you would need continual growth just like in all areas of life you have to be moving down the road of life to stay engaged in an area of your life and if you can't do that because you're kind of an isolated system that with no like new input you know it's just there's going to be a deadening of energy over time and i think that's you know really plagued plaguing our population a lot right now and it's kind of like this is the time in our um, culture when we're expected to have relationships that are satisfying and pleasurable not for any kind of real you know the structural reason and when that's not something people can sustain over, sustain over a lifespan you know it it puts the porn industry in a really good position to be very lucrative for sure and i think that's you know that's another thing is the the 
the energy of our sexuality being poured into pornography, if that's our main interface and outlet for our sexuality, I think that's also really robbing our culture. I don't think pornography is bad for any means, but I think that's a bad outlet for it. It can be. Yeah, it's there seem to be a lot of phenomenon like that where there's a legitimate niche to be filled to make up a gap that people are experiencing and not able to resolve. But as soon as you start making up that gap, that gap, that also becomes a limitation, right? That, that That's now yeah. the thing that's supplementing the gap and you don't necessarily go beyond that. Uh, one of the things that's been yeah. bubbling up in my mind that's a little bit, I mean, we, you can... Uh, go on, if you want to respond to what I just said, that's fine. But I was, I've been thinking about nuance because you were talking about the difficulty of, of moving forward and keeping things lively without external inputs. And I agree, but there's also internal inputs in terms of experiencing what you're already experiencing more deeply, being able to chew it up and assimilate it more. Because it's occurred to me that one of the things that changed my relationship to pornography, for example, was getting more specific about what I was responding to, not just going, oh, I like that. It's actually some bit of that that I like. There's some more specific detail that I'm responding to. And the more I looked in that way, the more I brought sharper perception in, but also I kind of deconstructed the experience. And I'm, I'm wondering if there's a balance that's necessary between getting external inputs and getting new inputs from within what's already happening internally. Oh, absolutely. I, th I think when I'm talking about external, I guess, I, yeah, I included internal, but I was not thinking about, in some ways, though, I think you would have to have some kind of lenses or frameworks to be able to do what you're doing. Or, you know, like, you kind of ended up there, like, hey, well, what is it about this specifically and, like, there's certain scenes in pornography that specifically call to a feeling of, like, certainty, like absolute desire. And in that case, there's no reason to worry about anything about myself. So it takes a certain level of anxiety away, right? But, like, these scenes that depict that for me, like the movie that makes me feel that, is just symbols for that in a way. And there's multiple different types of pornography that fill that need for me. And until I really felt like, Hmm, what am I getting from these? I couldn't step back and say like, oh, I really like to be really sure the other person wants to have sex with me so I don't have to worry, right? Like about that. And that's just really simple. And then it's like, oh, well, I can actually make that present for myself in my day-to-day -day sex life. So that's, you know, direct linkage, pornography improved my day-to-day -day sex life <laughs> pretty easily using the same type of thing you're pointing to. But I had to, you know, work out what, you know, how to look at that, understand it, and understand what it meant about myself, these scenes. And I think that's the layer where we don't really have any good um, models or, you know, teachings on how to use sexuality in a way to forge your evolution or just improve your day-to-day -day life in some ways. Like, sometimes it's just like, duh, that makes sense, you know, like... <laughs> Of course, I should do this, you know, um, but it was things you wouldn't have seen through a different lens. The possibility of um, coming to insights about life and about yourself by seeing uh, repeated threads across multiple instances of explicit material is really intriguing because I think there's a question in all of this around what quantity of access does to our brains. We know there's a big difference between cultures that have one book, they're oriented around a single holy text, and a culture that has millions of books. It does something different. It reorganizes how we experience the world. And pornography yeah. can give us access to seemingly unlimited number of observations of all kinds of humans doing all kinds of sexual things, and in particular to our response to those things. Uh, but then there's a question around, does, does sheer quantity diminish meaning or numb us to things? Or does it open us up to ranges of overview that allow us to draw conclusions that we couldn't draw from a very limited sample? Mm, 
I really don't like where you're going with this because it, it points to an area area at my edge that's really, really uncomfortable for me in my own process. <laughs> but um, so I think actually, you know, like did asceticism come from the lack of access? Like you, I think you were pointing to that earlier um, that, you know, people didn't have this access and it wasn't easily, you know, found. So you know, why not make the best of what you're handed, you know? And I think a lot of the old spiritual traditions were based on that, and I think there's certain things they found that though they learned to grow in absence of, of like, this, you know, stimulation and all this stuff, and they learned ways to do that, some of those ways were based on, you know, oh, well, I just didn't have anything. But they found certain things that I think are irreplaceably valuable um, due to the, you know, lack of stimulation. And when the lack of stimulation is there, I think there's a deep level of nuance that you can take in less stimuli because you're spending more time studying it and you notice the gradual onset of the impact of a single stimuli instead of just being barraged, you know. And I, I personally, like, I started out um, in more of a spiritual sexuality as a child and was very connected to a sense of erotic energy and the earth. And, you know, my sexuality didn't look like anything and I never saw porn. So the first time I had sex, I was like, wait, what just happened? That was not what I expected at all. I kind of had this, you know, homegrown version of what I thought that was going to be like. And I think in that, because I had no stimulus, I developed a lot I don't know, I developed different sensitivities than I, I tend to experience people having around my sexuality. And then I had to learn how to have like what more commonly happens out in society. And I've honestly like drowned out most of that initial like more spiritual or sensitive sexuality by learning, you know, adapting to other people that are more stimulated and grew up with porn and things like that. So that journey myself you know, I went from a, like, my sexuality is spiritual and just above everybody else's to actually, no, I can't do what you do. Why can't I do that? I want to be able to do that, too. I should at least be able to be a basic animal, right? And integrating all that, all those other pieces of it as well. And now I'm back to this place where I'm like, hmm, I don't know that I'm going to actually get that sensitivity and spiritual sense back um, unless I, you know, watch less porn, maybe. <laughs> But, um, you know, that's the thing I've gone back and forth with in my life, too. I think there is a tooling and titrating of the self-system and the sexuality, but I do think it's all rewirable. It's all changeable. It's all alive and moving. Like, I'm not afraid. I can't go back to that. It's not lost. It's just a matter of where I'm kind of ending up being right now. When you look back, do you think you would have been in a better position if you had more data about what people were doing and how they were thinking about sex as you went into it? Or do you think that you your developmental journey was really catalyzed by the mismatch between the, the ethos you approached it with and what you encountered, that that tension created a, like a, an engine for growth? It, yeah, it, I mean, well... So three, there's, there's yes to all those, right? Like, of course, it would have been different. And there was just pros and cons to each. It's kind of like a choose your own adventure, right? It would have been very different. And I did have full availability. Like, I knew what a vast deference was in fallopian tubes by the time I was five or six years old. I had an encyclopedia and I read it. But I didn't actually have any sense of what that connected to the sensuality and my, how my body felt to me, because I wasn't even imagining sex with another for the first four or five years I was exploring my sexuality. I was just exploring pure sexuality. Like, I didn't connect the feeling in my body to those diagrams in an encyclopedia. And my development's weird, and, you know, most people I know encountered something, they figured it out, or they thought about it. I think... Um, I think I blocked that out pretty heavily from myself as a child for various other reasons and traumas and, you know, just had this, the, whatever this is. Um, and so I had the physical knowledge. I think had I had that, I think it wouldn't have resulted in me being who I am today, though. Like it absolutely created like this huge bolus 
of experience that I chewed on at, at a certain level. And then when I tried to integrate back into the other side of sexuality, I could say that that popped, right? So I had multiple Satori experiences throughout my teens, um, and sex was a really um, impactful experience for me multiple times over and over. And then, you know, I found integral theory, like, not too long later and was like, oh, this is what's happening to me, you know? And, you know, so it had popped me into a, a lot of different states and experiences that I don't know I would have had if um, life had been different. Another aspect of this that's really intriguing to me is the question of evaluation. You know, if a person had had access to one form of stimulating material, well, that's one thing. But if they have access to options, then part of the experience is evaluating those options, right? And whether it's a magazine or a, a section of the video store or it's the internet, right? the last several media iterations of pornography have put uh, not only the content in front of people, but the situation in which you have to decide about the content. And that can be, I mean, part of the addiction itself in a way is, oh, I get to give a thumbs up or a thumbs down, the same as it is in every other area of contemporary social media. I'm the decider. I'm the evaluator. Um, I've spoken with people who spend more time um, giving their feedback to Pornhub about what they're viewing than they do actually having any kind of stimulating response to the content they're viewing. I'm curious how you look at the role that evaluation of stimulation plays in all of this. Mm -hmm. That's a really good question. I, um, I recently met someone who can identify porn stars by their genitals, different parts of their bodies, and has classified them into multiple categories. And I found that fascinating. And yes, I've, I've noticed how selecting stimulation for myself impacts me, but I'm like at a much lower level of development than that person, right? And when I encountered that, it was the first time I was kind of like, oh, like this could be a field of like, you know, like movies, like I love cinema, right? Like I just love it. And movies and TV have just exploded in the past 10 years. And there's all this, you know, older material too. So it's like, I have this catalog in my head of all these different types of movies. And I think the same thing applies to porn, you know, like it's just this wild field of creativity, except it's marginalized in a way that shapes the industry in a way that makes there's like a certain set of caricatures in porn. So it's really like, it's almost our sexual alter ego in what it represents, you know, like, and I think it's really immature. And I think, you know, and I, by immature, I don't mean like dirty as bad. And I think most people mistake, this is like some kind of a fallacy that, Porn is dirty and bad and perverted and corrupt because it breaks taboos. And tor porn is immature because it's not fully developed sexuality. Those are two separate things. They're not connected together. So, you know, porn, porn represents itself as people, you know, buy it. And I think most people have these kind of subculture sexual selves that aren't really connected to the rest of society. So I think that's what we see reflected in the porn because we don't know how to make porn for mature sexuality because there's not enough of us that have it. And I think that makes porn bad, but I don't think porn is bad, if that makes sense. I just think that most people know that there's more that could be there and they want to see that. So when they're selecting those stimulations, they're wasting, and the only problem I see is they're spending so much time trying to get the porn makers to make that sexuality that they have to then, they have to actually create for themselves, right? Like that we have to just make it up. We don't have anything else, right? And the people that are making up the new scenes and new ways of having sexuality aren't in the mainstream. And maybe they're not, there's not as many of them to actually be represented in pornography. So yeah, all that. 
Yeah, the question of the mainstream is uh, it's interesting because it's so easy to be mistaken about what we think the norm is. And I, I one thing I've encountered with people who don't have a history of accessing pornography is that they don't really know, especially in the current technology landscape, they don't really understand as they as in many other areas of their life, they don't understand that the information they're seeing is very tailored to them, right? So there's this assumption that if you were to just like drop in to a porn site somewhere, that you would be getting a fairly representative sample of what people are looking for in general. Uh, but in fact, everybody's in these um, training loops with quasi artificial intelligences now that are guessing and adjusting as we go forward. Uh, so that said, mm -hmm. there's also general trends that can be inspected. And one of those general trends yeah. is that we've seen an increase of, you, know, you and I mentioned this a little bit going back and forth before this, quasi-incest has become a much more prominent feature of pornography than seemingly it has been in the past. And the <laughs> question of why that is, is really intriguing, right? Is it's is it taboo violation? Is it, a, is it a recognition of a domestic element that's brought in? I think possibly a conservative argument would be that if you have too liberal a society in this regard, if you take away the stimulation provided by the conventional taboo structure, then people are going to constantly try to find that edge somewhere else. Uh, I'm curious what you think about quasi incest material in general, but also about the, the urge to find some material that puts you up against the question of your own edge. Yeah. So the, the, like, as far as incest goes, like, I also like, I think one, it's the shortest plot line you can think of in a way, because it's like, there's not a whole lot required other than this is what's happening. So just the fact that there's two bodies there and they are brother and sister is now named the story as the act. So you don't have to have a lead in. <laughs> See, that's typically what happens with that. Those types of porns. There's not a whole lot of story. And I think it cuts that out. I think it's also taboo in a way that most people aren't really attracted to. Like, I don't know a lot of people that are like struggling with being attracted to uh, like siblings as, you know, something that they, you know, was the end of their life, but, you know, maybe it happened for a few weeks or a time in your life and you passed and if you felt really bad about it and you shut it off, you know, so, um, you know, there's probably some juice there and maybe it's happened, you know, in a small way for a lot of people. I don't think, um, I don't think it's the most taboo thing. And I think that's why it's there because it's an acceptable taboo. Almost. It's a small taboo. It's not, you know, a gang rape or, you know, consensual non-consent or, you know, there's some really a lot darker taboos you can get into. It's almost a light taboo um, and it gives you an excuse to have younger actors, um, you know, and um, make a simple plot. So I think there's like a structural value to it, to the porn industry. But I also think um, as far as that edge goes, yeah, the the edge depends upon a child having ingrained in itself that doing bad stuff is fun stuff, right? So I think that's the place where it doesn't it doesn't connect as much with me. Um, I grew up in a household where that wasn't exactly how the line was drawn or something. So taboo to me just feels like, well, if society doesn't do it, then there must be something wrong. There must be danger there, right? So some people, I think, have a different gearing towards what taboo means. To me, it's kind of like, well, I see all these deer running this way. I should probably run too, if that makes sense. And like taboo for some people is like, well, the fun things were the bad things. So I want to do the bad things. So I think, that, do, you, do you see what I mean? Like, I think there's two different flavors there of how people. Yeah, I think if you're, a, I mean, if you grow up in a situation where the let's say top-down social information turns out to be useful and constructive and as minimal as it can be versus growing up in a situation where there's a whole bunch of unnecessary top-down instructions about social information that are even yeah. exaggeratedly yeah. enforced, you get a very different sense of the quality of the information and how you should respond to it. 
so for me, it was like, well, incest can result in babies being born with sad things. So don't do that. You know, like I got those types of messages. I didn't get a whole lot of that's dirty, you know, other than there was just no mention of sexuality in my household. So I never, I, it was just neutral kind of in some ways. Um, there were some negative things I had where I was exposed to porn as a child, but it was with a parent there and their disgust told me that that was awful. And then I didn't really think about it much more, if that makes sense. It was just like, oh, you're watching other people. And it was told to me as if you're spying on other people, like you're watching them. And that's bad, if that makes sense. So that was how I was hooked to stay away from porn as a child. But I think there's so many different ways that parents kind of would message that or install whatever it is that you get from your childhood around that, that some people would see porn as like their parents giggled about it. Like, oh, you found the DVD. Okay. Okay. Don't don't look at that. You know, and it's funny. So there's like a temptation there of like, oh, you're not allowed to have that, but one day you will. And it's kind of fun or funny or something. Right. So there's all kinds of different messaging we all grow up with. And I think that relates to how porn can be used as a tool also, because I think how you were structured as a child in that way, you don't get structured differently than you were in this childhood. So even if you heal all that trauma and replace a lot of that charge and stuff like that, you're still going to never have had a different way you grew up, right? So there's going to be some basic sense of how that structured your relationship to pornography for the rest of your life and that's going to inform how you can use it or not use it as a tool so you have to be aware of that also um as like a third axis right to be able to really make this useful the uh when you mentioned the the simplicity of the narrative setup with something like brother and sister Right, that all you have to do is put that in the title to achieve the absolute minimal narrative components. It made me mm-hmm. think of how how terrible the titles of porn videos have often been. That oh, people, you know, you encounter, you go, I wouldn't mind watching that, but why did they have to call it that? <laughs> and I'm there's this weird... to get hot in dishwashers now, man. Yeah. <laughs> It puts me in mind of this this odd conjunction between arousal states and negative social feelings and how many different ways there are to have that. Like um, one way is to want to do something dirty because of a social teaching that these things were dirty and they are connected to your arousal. So now your arousal goes towards something dirty. Another one is, Mm -hmm. I might have mentioned this in a previous interview, this famous Slavoj Žižek argument that um, in the age of full-length porn films, the lead into the story was usually so boring and so poorly acted that it functioned as the punishment that you were willing to accept in order to get the pleasure of something that was socially marginalized or denigrated. That's always intrigued me. Uh, And I relate to it a little bit in the sense that when I was younger, my response was to sort of like pay back or make good on the social complaint about pornography by doing something internal. Now, that turned out to be a pretty good strategy for me. But I thought as long as I was bringing in some kind of internal practice, I was like countering the balance, but there seem to be many different ways to adjust that balance in people's experience. That's a whole bunch of stuff. There's no question in there, but there might be some interesting ideas. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's really cool. Cause I did, I did kind of the same thing actually. And I've done that in a lot of areas. And I wonder if we have similar coding because that was the kind of like, Oh, the deer are all running this way. I should follow them. I'm not going to. I'm going to go see what's in the woods over here, but I'm going to take extra precautions. So it's like a little different flavor of yours. But I used to be like, okay, did that make me, did watching this make me want to rape anybody? You know, why or why not? And I would just like check to see, like, if, were there impacts that were negative? Were there impacts that were positive? And, and it wasn't maybe as nuanced as what you were doing, but I was like watching. 
kind of to make sure that there wasn't a negative impact. And then over time, that just developed into kind of noticing that my insecurity or discomfort or like maybe I'm bad, stuff like that, wasn't connected to any actual danger in the pornography. So it took me a long time to kind of say what's the worst that could happen. It probably took me 10 years, (laughs) honestly, like watching porn and then being like, okay, I feel disgust or whatever, but did it hurt me really? Is this a bad feeling? And I got to the end of that rope and then it was like, no, it's actually just a neutral, inert thing that you can see in the context of society and you can see it as a lens to see your society, um, as a lens to see humanity, as a lens to see yourself. Um, as and as a lens to get off. So it feels kind of like a win-win now, but there's been periods in my life where, you know, I had partners that used an obscene amount of pornography, and I was like, is this normal or not? Like, you know, and, um, you know, I've, I, there's been all, I've had issues in life with it where, you know, like there's certain acts in it that I question the ethicalness of and, can't really look at even if they do arouse me and now I can like I had to work through that kind of a thing within myself and you know the answer that well it's already on the internet I didn't pay for it so I didn't make it I'm not the unethical one you know like I think that's the answer a lot of people revert reverted to and it took me a long time to kind of think through that but yeah so yeah mine was just more safety based I think the way that I approached that the question of um, partners using pornography or pornography playing a role inside a sexual relationship is interesting. And I wonder if you have any any general observations about where where pornography within a relationship has undermined sexuality and the quality of the relationship, where it might have been neutral, where it might have been positive. Yeah. I've had experiences of both like drastically in opposite directions and, and just relationships where it wasn't really a present thing at all. I think, I think there's something, there's a, there's something in pornography that allows us to step outside of ourselves because there's this kind of, you know, this taboo or we know this is an alternate environment. We know there's like this, absolute need to keep it kind of secret and safe and to ourselves. So it's almost like stepping aside to meditate in a way, right? Like there's a practice to pornography and it might be different for everyone, but we all kind of make a mental shift when we watch pornography, I think. And I think it's interesting because, you know, in a relationship, if you have these little zones where you've made these pockets of little lovely fantasies that you have that turn you on, And then you're seeking out porn that's, you know, feeding those fantasies. It's kind of like that's a life you're living by yourself. So when you can relate to another person from that life and show them like what you like about it and what pornography you like. For me anyway, when somebody shares that with me, it's almost like I get an extra world in my video game, right? Like I, I, maybe not, it might not work for me, but like these little different places and stuff. Like it's really, it's really intimate for me to share those with someone and see like why they came into being aroused by that. And just being able to watch them kind of construct a reality in which they're fully alive and in themselves, you know, like I think that's one of the most intimate, powerful things you can do in a way. And pornography is a great vehicle to give you, a Dumbo feather or something to hold on with to start doing that with someone, right? Because just sitting down and staring at each other and being like, I like this is, 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 you know, it's, it's very direct and stuff. And if you're, you know, so if you really want to explore someone, I think um, that's a good entry route to just be able to, instead of Netflix and chill, like pornography and disgust maybe or something and other things. We live in an age that's sort of skewed toward reality TV and amateurishness because of how prevalent recording technologies have become. Uh, Everybody can be the content if they want to. And it seems to have led to an Mm -hmm. enormous explosion in uh, officially amateur pornography, but also in people 
presenting themselves as pornographic objects, you know, whether it's the sort of unwilling harassment of someone receiving uh, unsolicited dick pics or whether it's people trying to build part of their relationship by uh, showing stylized sexual versions of themselves to each other. Uh, curious what your sense of that is and what your sense, if any, of of having experimentally engaged in something like pornography or the recording and depiction of your sexuality. Yeah. So I think actually, I think a lot of it is it's making visible social dynamics that have always been the case and it's making it easier and more clear what roles people are playing, what the rules are and something like, a commons of, you know, sexual exchange, if that makes sense. So we might exchange, you know, like there's a love language access service, right? We might exchange chores or kind acts with our neighbors and things like that in many, many, many other domains socially. And there's a commons for that kind of, and maybe it's a little, cr it's crumbling a little bit right now, but you know, like I have, I brought stoop bones over to my neighbor's dogs a few weeks ago, right? Like, and that's a neighborly thing. So <laughs> I know that's a really weird example, but I think in some ways people are starting to show out their sexuality towards each other and not just in an exploitative way. The people that are showing out their sexuality feel like they're getting to express a part of themselves. And I think it's easier to just express yourself with like a given social construct and that in your own sexuality than it is to actually make that up yourself. So I think we're giving a lot more people, um, you know, a paintbrush basically to consider showing up as, as them full, their, their full self sexually um, and to basically explore what that would look like. And I think in the process, a lot of people are realizing their sexuality doesn't look like what is sold in porn. So they're making anonymous porn, you know, they're making uh, amateur porn and stuff, but, and they're mimicking, either they're mimicking pornography or, you know, you see people mimicking pornography and then you see people really doing, you know, some inane, like just kind of personal stuff and you can tell the difference and you can see and kind of flesh that out. And I think, so I think it's a good thing overall. I think more people are being more expressive and I think, even if you're being expressive in a pathological or non-growth oriented way, it's just the fact that people are expressing their sexuality now that it's, you know what I mean? Like we need to extrude this blockage. <laughs> so I'm hoping that things like OnlyFans are going to, you know, help us integrate a lot of these sexual, our sexual selves, and learn to orient to each other as sexual beings. And I think the LGBT com community, you know, is starting to like, they, they kind of started that whole conversation and now it's like a weird mix where they're connected to the message of expressing your sexuality, but also they're, pro they're proponents for expressing your sexuality separately from being LGBT, right? So that movement isn't separate from just the movement of, integrating a lot of ourselves even though we don't fit into the mainstream um i'm not sure if that that kind of went off the rails but that was the thought no, process that fine. happens that's when fine. you <laughs> you know <laughs> something that popped up for me was uh you know so many people report peak experiences and spiritual dimensions to their sexuality i never hear anybody reporting spiritual experiences with pornography i'm not sure if they just don't think of it that way or don't report it or whether there's some fundamental difference there that's not leading to so many of those exalted experiences hmm. yeah i think um let's see so my experience of spirituality with pornography is more archetypal and it's more connected to everything as sex showing up in one specific slice of sex showing up. You know, like 
Um, it's it's almost like being too on the nose for the experience of like sex as everything in a way, but it's also beautiful in ways that you know do connect to a deeper sense of spirituality. But usually, if I'm looking for pornography, I'm not looking to be met spiritually, right? Because you don't really need another, you don't need visual stimuli to kind of experience that spiritual, um, energetic sense. Like it's more of a kinesthetic um, almost or a felt sense. So I think usually it's when that physical component to match that spiritual energetic sense is missing um, that I would make, that I would like associate with porn, if that makes sense. So um, I think that's probably true for most of the people I've known that have been spiritually oriented sexually is more like just the physical act may be lacking, but the spiritual act is also lacking without the physical. That makes sense. Sure. A few minutes ago, you mentioned like a transformation in some content that you previously were not really able to watch or tolerate and then sort of becoming over time able to explore and experience that curious what kind of content that might have been but i'm more curious uh, about about you at the moment like what's are there types of porn you currently can't stand or really to find obnoxious <laughs> obnoxious i i really hate the gagging blowjobs i really hate that i find it obnoxious I think gagging happens, but I think, um, the, you know, the egregious version of it. Um, I think the um, squirting porn where people are literally pissing on each other and it's fine. Like waterworks are great. Enjoy them if you want. Call them squirting if you want. It's fine. It just annoys me. And not that squirting isn't a separate phenomena, but in porn, that's not what we're seeing happen typically. Um, I think those like hyper-realized things that are actually causing people it bothers me when it's when it's porn that's hurting people, right? When it's hurting people through their consumption of it, um, because there's untruth in it. That and like the lack of the lack of clarity for people that are coming into porn. Sometimes I'll think about this when I'm watching porn. Like, oh my god, I can't imagine being like 12 years old and coming into this. You know, like God, that would be awful. So that's most of what bothers me about it. The stuff I can't watch is stuff. I wouldn't say I can't watch anything. I can't watch pain. Um, I watched a porn once where somebody was taking fish hooks and hooking um, labia, and that um, just, it traumatized me. It just set me off. Like, it just made me really sad, and it felt, <laughs> it was like, why, <laughs> you know? Um, so that's not a thing that I can really watch. I mean, I could if I had to, but I would not enjoy it. And then there's, I don't like watching the stories of porn usually like there's, I'm very picky about the stories. Some of those just turn me off completely when they act oh, is it just really sleazy and stuff like that. What are the other acts? So the stuff I couldn't watch that I'm really into now, um, I really like um, gangbang porn. There's just an abundance of, <laughs> of what you want. And it's not like it's a, there's that constancy, right? It's there. It's not going anywhere. You're going to get fucked. Um, so that kind of sense of certainty in that, you know, appeals to me. And that's one of the porns that I was originally like, this looks awful. She looks like she's being hurt. You know, <laughs> like I feel sorry for her, that type of thing. Um, so I, I did have holdups and it was mostly because when I see porn, um, I, it's, it, I connect really strongly with the people's facial expressions and stuff. And I'm very kind of aware of what I think is going on in their bodies when they're having sex. And in those specific types of porn, sometimes I really don't like what I think is going on inside the person's body. Um, so I had to get over that and also just find better quality porn because I, I didn't spend a whole lot of time like sourcing my porn or anything like that. So I had to learn to do that better. What am I into right now? I, I I need a second to think about that, actually. I think orgies are kind of a thing for me right now in a big way, but there's not any orgies out there that I've seen that I really connect with. Like, I want to see an orgy in nature, 
not like not like rugged nature where you can't go inside and get a shower. I mean, like a really nice, like scenic RV park or something, you know? And I want people there to just be relaxing and totally like have sex and sex acts integrated into their life. I think that would be really fascinating to watch for me and really, it would be helpful in arousing a certain kind of sense I have in myself, but I don't really have um, a model for, um, like modeling a certain type of experience, I guess, in my psyche, because I want to grow this capacity to just kind of have sexuality like a pilot light kind of burning all the time where it's just present in myself and integrated in all situations, right? And that creative play of it is accessible for me in all situations. And I think I kind of have that now, but there's just a lot more rewiring to be done around that, you know? So there's, I had this yearning for kind of a group situation like that and being able to model that in my mind because it would help to deconstruct some other things that are in the in its place. There's a weird analogy between uh, gangbangs, orgies, and integral theory because mm -hmm. there's a sense of bringing many different kinds of valuable energy together in the same swarm, right? Not having a value and another value, but having a whole bunch when you get the integral map or mm -hmm. any kind of, you know, complementary or analogous meta theory experience of the world, you're trying to say, well, how many of these can be simultaneously affirmed in all of their differences? Uh, so that's yeah. interesting. It would be interesting to build a, an integrative I don't know how he would do that. A gangbang shaped <laughs> model of values integration. <laughs> oh, I'm going to have to go drawing now. <laughs> yeah, I think, um, I think I could definitely work on that. That'd be pretty fun. Actually have a red meme, you know, big guy with, you know, purple meme, witch lady and a bunch of characters. Do you remember some of the first pornography you ever encountered? Mm. Yeah, actually, um, when I was 17, my boyfriend had, um, I found pornography under his mattress and he had quite a lot. Um, so the first porn I watched was, it was just a doggy style porn. It was kind of like, I think the people in it looked like they were kind of like from backwoods, Ohio or something, you know, like they had a, I think the guy had a camo hat on and the chick had like a star, you know, like stars and stripes bathing bikini on or something. Like it was kind of like a redneck porn. <laughs> and um, I'm trying to think, like, I remember not being aroused by it in the moment. I remember like a kind of crunching sensation of freezing kind of like, I don't know what to feel about this and like a shame, like a heat in my face. And I remember just a really direct, clear awareness, like almost like to danger, but also just taking it in a hundred percent. Like, Oh my God, what is this? This is crazy. You know? And there's like excitement and thrill in there too. But the, like, I'm holding that back because it's like, that's the last thing that's going to happen because we have to make sure what is going on here first, like what is safe first. And I think I kind of stayed in that stance towards pornography for quite a few years after that. And I had, you know, boyfriends that used it, but I just kind of, it just was out of sight, out of mind, I guess. I just didn't really care one way or the other. Um, it just wasn't something that, it was something that like put me on alert. So I didn't like enjoy watching it, if that makes sense. I think, though, in my 20s, um, by my 20s, I started to uh, get into some of the bigger, bigger porn, like they had like a Pirates of the Caribbean porn or something. And I don't know why, but these spoof movies like were like the thing that got me into pornography in my 20s. I dated a guy that was uh, like he was part of a traveling. They, they built um, cell phone towers and stuff like that. And he ran a crew and they travel a lot. So I went to stay in his apartment with him and his crew. Um, and that's what they decided to watch one evening. So I sat in a room with a bunch of um, cell phone tower riggers uh, watching Pirates of the Caribbean porn. And I actually enjoyed it. And I was like, oh, this is kind of hot, you know, and was like, why was I so upset by that before? 
so then I started to kind of get into it and like look at what are the different genres and at first it was kind of just like it wouldn't take me very long to like get off with porn so it was just kind of like a stimuli uh, if I wanted to have a fast orgasm I didn't really pay much attention to it beyond that I didn't use it very often so it wasn't until like the last 10 years that I've really um you know, used it somewhat heavily, used it in relationships, um, and had it be a growth tool. And I would say the last three or four years primarily. Um, the last three or four years, I've been working more with trauma and porn. So I've been looking at things that are potentially um, adjacent to trauma and how that structured strategies I have in my life that I want to shift. So, you know, that, that's a whole area we can talk about if you want. Yeah, I, w- I would love to explore that. Um, but first, I'm curious about this spoof movies thing, because certainly, and I don't know what the situation <laughs> is now, but it seemed like for decades, a huge amount of money in the porn industry is being put into making absolutely ludicrous <laughs> versions <laughs> of popular films. And what yeah. is it that people find so engaging about that? Is it is something about the humor and the silliness and the absurdity that's that's welcoming, that's not off-putting? Or is there something, something secretly ridiculous about sexuality that we're presencing by doing that? I mean, I think it's really just there's an experience you've had in your regular day-to-day life, and we're taking porn and putting it into that context like it's accepted it feels like porn is accepted and it's mainstream and it feels like you're porning with others right like everybody saw pirates of the caribbean and i think everybody saw some spoof movie of porn so it kind of feels like a camaraderie or something that you don't normally have like you're not just watching um some dirty video somebody made off in a corner you know like it's connected to a big blockbuster hit or something that's you know kind of ubiquitous in society and that just makes it feel um it's there's a sense of added belonging i think to that so what uh what kinds of things are you pointing towards when you mention exploring porn that's trauma adjacent well i think i think a lot of our what turns us on in pornography is connected to the character strategies we form very young in life and i've done uh i've been i guess working with you know clients around that specifically and there's the whole like area of like bdsm and using that to work with trauma adjacent stuff but you can also do it with pornography or regular sex like it's just basically looking at it through the lens of well i can go into you know in specific for me right now humiliation is a thing that really 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 triggers me right i have like rejection dysphoria do not like rejection do not like i have like this huge unworthy drive you know from childhood and all that stuff right so i've you know worked through a lot of that in a lot of ways but there's this visceral sense where um i think it's hard to work with it outside of something as transformative and charged as like that sexual energy when you bring it into it it's really got a lot of capacity to rewire different parts of your brain. It's been one of the most effective ways that I've developed psychologically in my life is, you know, through connecting it with sexuality. So with trauma adjacent stuff, if that humiliation was something I experienced in childhood, like I did, and it was really traumatic as a child, um, going back through that, you can either go through the route of repetition or, um, repetition with agency right so i'm going to go watch pornography where somebody's being humiliated in a way that really triggers me but i'm choosing to be here i'm choosing to watch this pornography i'm in control that's not actually happening to me anymore so i'm adjacent to my trauma if i can stay out of that trigger and actually bring myself close to it um, it's very easy for me then to reference those experiences as a child and really get into those and have this as a prop and what we find is that a lot of those character strategies are actually our biggest turn-ons. So somebody might not be a repetition with agency person like me. They might be a person where they want resolution. So they want affirmation. They want to be told what a good girl they are, that kind of thing. And that angle 
works also, right, for that type of humiliating um, or degradating emotional abuse that some people go through. So working with those spaces and being able to set up a scene like that for yourself with pornography or with a lover or with a practitioner, you know, like can really be (laughs) transformation through pleasure, right? It's a good route to grow through. There's a kind of a uncertain relationship between healing and developing. And when I hear you talking about uh, the kind of thing they do in exposure therapy, which is to encounter something again voluntarily, uh, Mm -hmm. I think about the ways in which that might be available to catalyze people's ongoing growth. Certainly a lot of maybe not a lot, but some spiritual traditions have tried to utilize humiliation as an, as an ego transcending activity in general, or not necessarily to make up a a deficit or an early life learning, but to sort of constantly be an active participant in sabotaging the kind of values that the fixity of the psyche is always trying to propose for us. Um, Is there a way you think that humility could be useful as an ongoing tactic when it's engaged intentionally? Absolutely. And I mean, you got to the point, you said two things that I think are, you know, I think you basically said it. I think, you know, as far as the difference between healing and growth, if you're doing broad passes of humiliation across your cell system and you recognize that that's not actually what's happening, but you can't control your response to it, you're finding gold there, right? You're finding a part of you that even though you consciously know this is happening to you through your own intention and actions, is triggered by it. So it's not in the present moment, um, and it's reacting to something that isn't actually here. So that's a really clear marker for healing or growth, right? And it doesn't really matter which. Um, I think it's a really helpful tool in that way Um, And I think that learning how to hear another's words and be able to separate what an actual, separate what an actual like negative criticism is from actual constructive feedback, there isn't a way to actually humiliate somebody in a way where you're going to miss a message that you need to hear from another person when they're humiliating you. And I think that's a really hard thing to learn in your body without having that experience and realizing, you know, I don't have to have this shame or this fear of others judging me because if they're judging me in this way, if they're humiliating me and degrading me, they're not doing anything that's ever going to have been good for my growth or myself. And I shouldn't actually let any of this land. Um, And it's really hard to get there. I'm not there completely yet myself, but I've moved in that direction so much through that practice. Um, And I actually haven't, you know, I mean, just, just using pornography, like it's, it's, it does put me on edge a bit to watch that, but it's also, if I'm identifying with that character and those things happening to me, it's also liberating in a way. Um, There's a little bit of discomfort with it, but there's this liberation on the other side of it where um, you recognize that you are impervious to any actual humiliation in a way. And I don't mean like invulnerable. I mean totally open to it, but it's not going to hit you in any way, really, um, unless there's something in you that already says that you don't, you know, that you're not worthy or you don't deserve to be here. There's some kind of belief in there already inside yourself that it's landing in. There's so many pieces of that sound to me like the mechanisms that generate metacognition, right? There's the self-watching aspect. There's the attempt to decide whether to let something land as opposed to the normal human response, which is it just lands or not. There's the um, volunteering to be in the kind of cognitive dissonance space between multiple different subsystems within us having different responses like to occupy Mm -hmm. the in-between and the around of our various psychological pluralities. That's fascinating. And you can do this while you masturbate. (laughs) (laughs) It's it's (laughs) win-win. It's a win-win. But yeah, Um, I think there's a lot of room for 
you know, building something like, like a practice around this in many people's lives. And I think it could generally be uh, a beneficial thing and it probably will make use of space and time that they're already, you know, interacting with some kind of subject material around. So it's kind of like something that you don't have to build a meditation practice to work with. It's already something you do on a semi-regular basis. Is there anything we haven't discussed that you are really intrigued by in this topic? Or maybe another way to say that is, what do we have to do to make this the greatest conversation about pornography that's ever taken place? Ooh, that's a good way to say that. Mm. Well, I think we haven't touched on the hot button topic, right? So men's and women's differences around pornography. Um, and I, I moderate a lot of, you know, reddits around sexuality. And one of the things I see there a lot is the, con- the, the, the seeking to control or feeling insecure around pornography by women and the, you know, claimed need of it by men. And I wonder if that's something we should cover. That was another topic I wrote to you about. Yeah, I'm just looking for a way into the question. There is certainly um, a performed discomfort that's statistically prevalent among a bunch of women, at least within a certain cultural framework, and a performed affirmation verging on need among a bunch of males in that same cultural framework. Um, It is curious to me to think about the degree to which those might be co-creating each other right to to what degree are those two conversations that are um could fuse into a good conversation but which are sort of actively holding each other apart yeah and do they actually they may exist in my mind, in some ways, they almost exist, almost exist like a coin that you're trading back and forth as value to show different dynamics in a relationship, like to to gen, ge, to generate the appearance of exclusivity and being the one men give up pornography for women. And, you know, like if they won't, then they're disgusting or they're shaming, right? And I just realized that the line we're talking along is actually how the genders, like people socialized as women, people socialized as men, are um, shamed out of their sexuality, right? So, I mean, men are conditioned very differently than women, but men are also not, they don't have the access to be able to make sexual, you know, initiate, try to initiate sexuality in a public space or things like that anymore. So they're kind of, funneled in their like attention span into pornography. Um, and then women are, you know, basically taught to be a sexual commodity in some ways, like pretty porn princess, you know, if, if I can keep my sexuality pure, but also sell it as a commodity, um, then I can exchange that for goods or something. And you see all these rich videos of, you know, uh, videos of rich people, looking people, women that are scantily clad and that type of thing. So, there's something here where we're connecting it to the rest of society, right? Like it's spilling out into the archetypes of how we should be good or bad, but it's also spilling into the archetypes of how we exchange sex in relationship, like in a commons. Do you think women are taught that there's a question around pornography, like that the the, their identity as women and how women are thought of, that there's sort of, um, that there's a cultivation of this sense that you have to approach this material as a query about yourself as a type and about how society interacts with you as a type. And maybe the men are not, not instructed to approach it with a question that way. Mm, yeah. I, I think you just nailed it. That's that's it. So, yeah, as a woman, whether you're that type of girl or not, or whether you are accessible or not, is something that you're associating with to determine your value and worth in society. Um, and it's kind of like you can trade some of your sexuality almost for 
people's attention. But if you do that, you're diminishing your worth overall. But also there's this kind of demand that you do that in order to be a woman. You know, you have to be sexual or attractive or something like that at the same time. So it's kind of a double bind in a way. Um, and I'm sure there's a corollary on the male side. Um, but yeah, it's definitely like we're we're taught to associate our ego to the position of how we'll behave in relationship to being attractive. There are, seem like there are a lot of ways on the sort of stereotyped male side of that in terms of expressing it as a need. It's very easy to exaggerate the degree to which something is a need um, as a kind of a bargaining chip in a conversation. Um, but it also seems like there's a lot of uh, reluctance and lack of grace in people's ability to uh, express the emotional quality of need around sexuality and around sexual stimuli of various kinds, including pornography. Uh, it does seem to be that there's a there's a kind of conversation and a reorganization of our lives that's possible if someone can say, um, this is actually, this is important to me, but that requires a certain vulnerability that often we don't get to when we say, well, I just need this. And it's maybe a physiological need or something. It doesn't quite approach the fact that it's actually more of an emotional nourishment or a sense of the securing the emotional securing of the ability to access certain stimulations. Mm. Yeah, I think, I think that probably that might impact people socialized as men more because women are taught to some degree that, you know, sex is related to a relationship and you know getting married in that whole escalator. And I think women are also, you know, we give birth to children. So there's more, onus on making sure that emotional side is safe at least or met or you know whatever but that engagement's there but I think that's across both genders that you know that intimacy need isn't something that's spoken as as separate from sexuality really in our culture and you know the way that we discuss sexuality is typically not associated with intimacy either. So we don't have any other means to kind of reach out for just closeness or just acts, having that access, you know, like you said, like just being able to access that. And that's where the two sides I think would really be served by being in conversation around why pornography is limited, you know, potentially by women and consumed as a need by men, potentially meaning you know, women are kind of seeking that emotional intimacy first and not giving sexuality first. And I think men tend to see sexuality as a, as a gateway to emotional intimacy. So they're not really giving that emotional intimacy up front and they're wanting to know that sex is going to be something that they can access and women are wanting that emotional access. And I think if there was just a discussion around how they do integrate pornography as then just a movie about other people having sex we're seeing something or a tool or you know it's not something where we're replacing um the object of our attraction because that intimacy is a whole other realm that isn't present in pornography and is something we all need and it's probably more important than the actual sex acts that we're participating in yeah there is something very interesting about what we might call masculine and feminine styles in this regard. It seems like there's a young style that emotionally wants a symbolic or a technical target state to be met before uh, unfolding into open-ended emotional relating. Uh, and then there's this yin style that wants to either begin with or have as part of the initial process a more open-ended intimacy and emotional relating, uh, which may or may not lead toward a target state. And then, like, this is very broad. It goes far beyond sexuality. Yeah, it goes, yeah, it goes, it goes to a whole other realm. And I think, I think a lot of the context for pornography actually speak to that realm, though. And, like, that background of what we experience during sexuality is something that does 
is important to our sexuality. Like a lot of people want things, want to feel certain ways during sex that aren't related to the specific acts they're experiencing, right? They may want to feel like they're on adventure, they're in a, a situation of adventure or they have variety or they have options or they're safe or they're taken care of or there's so many things like that that are going to be related to that background or that larger sense of life um, and intimacy and how we relate and socialize that do connect to our sexuality but are also much bigger orders to fill than just a simple sexual relationship. Like you would need um, the culture to actually meet you in that way and your life and the people around you to meet you in that way in a way too, right? Like so there isn't really anything that you can take out of the picture of being connected to our sexuality, even though we do that and we kind of divorce it from everything else in our lives. I'm, As a culture. I mean. Yeah. I'm still feeling some curiosity around um, the role that access plays in the masculine mode. Thinking of, say, the way strip club performances are handled, because it's very interesting if you sort of watch a strip club scene from an alien perspective. You know, like here's usually a bunch of men watching a woman come out with clothes on and remove them, and as soon as they're removed, she leaves. <laughs> so you could imagine they want to see her naked, but what they actually want is the clothing to be removed. And once that's been accomplished, the, the the situation is secure. The access is secure, which reminds me of having pornography under your mat mattress or, you know, going into the warehouse and they've got a half, half naked calendar on the wall, this sort of young temperament that wants to remind itself that access to sexual intimacy is secured and then decide whether they want to move toward that or not. But the first thing is this sort of emotional need to, feel like access is available. Yeah, I think that's that's interesting because it, actually the access is more of a turn on for me also in some ways than the actual act or moving towards it. Um, it's nice just to feel that around you all the time. And sometimes like the thing I was saying earlier about keeping your sexuality integrated and having that like erotic pilot light on, you know, just that, that, pleasure. It doesn't have to mean that you're sitting there like objectifying people that are sitting next to you. It just means, you know, you feel you feel connected to, you know, whatever is sexual in your body and that's allowed to move and be with you. You know, having that access turned on, I think just that symbol of it makes it safer to do that because having that pilot light turned on and having your ironic energy present and then feeling like that's going to get rejected or there won't be access or, you know, that type of thing can really be a turnoff. So, yeah, I think mentally you can just kind of assume that or something in your mind, but having those visual representations definitely helps. And um, there's a sense of security and belonging of your sexual self that it, you know, imbues. And I think that's why pornography has been around in humanity since we've made pictures or art, because, um, that's the type of thing that we want to be around. We want to be around sexual access. This pilot light idea, it intrigues me in the sense of making a lot of this more subtle because the thing we've been just discussing around uh, content that emotionally secures access by presenting the desired object arouses desire right so in a way you're securing access to the experience of desiring and you're using a representation yeah. of a desired object to get that but i think when we make that shift then we have more let's say tantric options to try to secure access to our own experience of desire more regularly and not use so many external prompts except artfully as we might want to yeah, I think that's absolutely true as well. But in the way I would say that is kind of like, you know, if you just notice what happens within your body or energies when you see, you know, a beautiful woman or a really attractive man and how that kind of moves or catalyzes or opens or whatever it does to your energy and stuff, 
just notice that kind of sense. Notice what's happening there. Notice what's breathing there. Notice what's moving there and how that kind of continues to move, you know, all the way through the process to orgasm if you want, you know, and and really just look at those energies and then be able to replicate that and be able to play with that specifically and those mechanisms. And they're always present. It's just we're using the image and associating it with it. Um, but yeah, I think I think there's definitely many ways to like deepen the practice into a felt sense, you know, energetic tantric um, practice and then be able to you know, in, in my case, what I do is I take imagery within myself, like ways I see the world, like I'll put a frame up like a diorama of how I see the world, and then I'll move that sexual energy as that world that I perceive. And that's kind of the world I'm projecting into the world on a day-to-day basis, right? So I'm playing with the mechanisms that I perceive the world through sexually and moving those energies as myself. And that's you know, shown me a lot of things about the mechanisms of how Lauren or anonymous guest structures structures everything. <laughs> <laughs> That's how the bag. If somebody was just beginning to explore pornography for the first time at any age, uh, what kind of general advice would you give them in terms of setting them up to go through it in a reasonably healthy way that might also open to deeper development? So I think what I would say is definitely don't lose the capacity to just be intimate with your body and its sensations and map the physical, just the physical sensations of your body head to toe and see what feels good. And then pay attention to how you use what feels good in your body while you're watching porn and see if it changes and see if the map of your body changes when you see certain types of porn. Um, I'd say be very careful about the content you pick. Choose content that is actually attractive to you as you imagine you would engage in that situation in real life and then see what it would be like. Imagine yourself in the actor's shoes also choose pornography that you would never engage with in real life, but that, you know, arouses you. And don't limit arousal to, like, genital arousal. If something is just curious to you, it's probably something that your psyche has something to do with. Like, you, you've, got some, you've got juice there. Don't traumatize yourself by picking things that are going to scar you or anything. Like, don't go after causing yourself harm. But if there's interest, there's interest. And sometimes that'll unfold into types of sexuality that are less genitally focused and more focused on, you know, orgasms happen between your ears. So if the story is interesting to you, if the way they're dressed is interesting, if the scene is interesting, if who knows what, you know, it's an oddity to you, it might unlock something that isn't just that genital arousal, you know, and that's fine too. Definitely look at that too. But there's a, there's a lot of different types of sexuality you can access through porn other than just the obvious ones. That sounds like curiosity, somatic sensing, um, decontracted awareness, and authenticity. Wow, that was so pithy. Yes, <laughs> correct. <laughs> okay, well, maybe that's enough. Yeah, that was, I think I think that's good. I think we did it. <laughs> okay, we had the greatest Are conversation you... about pornography anyone's ever had. Yes, definitely <laughs> to date. All right. Well, thank you so much, anonymous guest. Thank you, anonymous host. This was lovely. 